further debate. I recognize the member from Oshawa. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I'm glad to be able to take my place in this legislature and discuss the Agricultural Research Institute of Ontario Amendment Act, um, which is, I will say, a, a non-contentious bill. This is our second opportunity to discuss uh, agriculture and innovation in this space. Um, a little bit of intro for folks about what this bill is uh, seeking to accomplish. It's the ARIO Act modernization uh, that is at the heart of it. And I'll read from the, uh, the briefing from the ministry um, uh, that created in 1962, the ARIO is a board governed agency of the province accountable to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. They own real property and enable applied uh, agri-food research is enshrined in the ARIO Act. However, the definitions around the type of agri-food research the ARIO supports is outdated, could be more relevant to the modern agri-food research environment that the agency is supporting today across academia and industry. All that to say that there is uh, there are some pretty um, important changes in terms of modernizing this act, but not necessarily substantive. The act currently limits the areas of research to agriculture, veterinary medicine, and household science. This focus is too narrow, doesn't clearly address the current research and innovation initiatives occurring in the agri-food sector in Ontario. And this debate has been a lot of, of members telling stories about innovations in their writings, uh, the importance of, of getting ahead of challenges like food waste, and of listening, uh, listening to farmers and working with researchers to make important connections, whether that's about increasing food yield, whether that's about dealing with climate change. Um, all of these pieces have to fit and could fit better. Um, and so in the province, um, I think there are 14 research centers. And this is an act that will be amending the Agricultural Research Institute of Ontario Act. One of the changes in the act is instead of using the word institute, it's going to be Agricultural Research and Innovation Ontario. Order. Sorry, Sorry Speaker. I used to be an elementary educator, and I get, uh, I get distracted by the gum chewing, the note passing, and the yammering. But, um, no, S Speaker, I'm going to do my best to focus. Um, there are a number of research centres in the province. Uh, the real-world field tests conducted at these research centres promote agri-food discoveries, validate laboratory findings, stimulate further research, and provide valuable information for Ontario's agri-food sector. And these research centres, owned by the Agricultural Research Institute of Ontario, are operated and managed by the University of Guelph through the Ontario Agri-Food Innovation Alliance. So we had heard from our uh, agriculture, food and rural affairs critic um, now for a, a couple of hours in total um, about this bill, but really they are um, top level changes, but imagining the potential of research and innovation in the agri-food uh, industry is limitless. So, Speaker, I wanted to give you a little bit of my, my history and interest. Um, I'm actually not someone standing in this legislature with a political science degree. Um, I, I was going to be a doctor for a very short period of time in my own mind, and then it turned out in university that it was very clear that I was not going to become a doctor. Um, but I did defect into a general biology degree uh, and had the opportunity to do some field research um, the feeding habits of starfish was one that I did on the East Coast and spent uh, part of a summer in the rainforest of, of South Vietnam actually doing a survey of tadpoles and, and frogs with researchers from the University of Mississippi at the time. An interesting life that I had before. Uh, turns out I was pretty good at drawing, so I would sketch the mouth parts of tadpoles in, uh, in Vietnam. And that's that's a little something you know, fun for the folks at home to know. But I do have a real interest in science, in potential, in, in, in uh, innovation, and how it connects to our real lives. Um, you know, in, in terms of uh, the fish research and aquaculture, 
When I did my undergrad at Queen's University, I had the opportunity to do a little bit of study at Lake Apinacon, which is where the Queen's University Biological Station is. And for over 70 years, they've been doing uh, ecological research there and evolution, conservation, and whatnot. And I dabbled, but I appreciated uh, the work that, that researchers were doing there. So imagining the work that happens in, I believe, is it Alma? I'm looking, hold on. Yeah, um, Alma is doing work on aquaculture. It's a fish research center, and it's, it's among the 14 research centers we've been talking about here uh, in this legislature. But in Alma, they have 10 buildings, 365 fish rearing units for production and research, but full range of fish from eggs to brood stock. Um, and they have been doing research that folks across the province have no idea about, but it, it makes a difference uh, to how we eat, to how we, um, how we interact with, with our waterways. And it's, it's interesting to know kind of what is, what is across our communities in spaces that most of us aren't aware of. Um, I will say that my father has a little hobby farm, and I won't actually say where he lives because I'm pretty sure well, anyway, um, I'm sure what he's doing is perfectly, uh, it's perfectly legal, there's no question there, but I think that the building inspectors, when he was trying to get the permits to build his aquaponics greenhouse, was maybe the first time um, that the building inspector had ever seen plans for this particular um, greenhouse. But he's got catfish in the bottom, he's got tanks growing various uh, various plants, a fig tree for, for one of the things in there. He's learned a lot about pollen, self-pollinating plants. Um, he learned it the hard way. He had to you know, pollinate by hand his first year, all of these things. Um, my father is not a research center. Uh, <laughs> maybe he could share some of his, some of his findings uh, with folks who actually know, um, who've had a couple more years to learn, but there, there are ways that we connect with, uh, with interesting, innovative ideas, personally, but of course, provincially. I had mentioned earlier that uh, I'm part of the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Legislative Caucus. Um, and I've had the opportunity, as we're talking about Great Lakes, um, Great Lakes health and the Great Lakes future, we have had the opportunity to work with farmers and visit demonstration farms uh, in all of our watersheds and have talked about the importance of building trust and relationships and showing evidence-based approaches and working with farmers to both build the trust but also that is a two-way street that research has to be informed by what is happening on a farm if farmers are going to implement some of these processes to reduce runoff of um, of the nutrients that they so carefully are trying to manage. Fertilizer is not cheap, and it's not something you just want to wash into the river. You want to apply it at a time that you get the most yield, but also that you have the, the least amount of runoff. And when folks live in communities and they're concerned about uh, algae blooms and whatnot, we definitely know that that nutrient management piece, which is a, a part of the research and innovation, but also the agricultural umbrella, uh, we have a lot of work to do to bring these bring these conversations together and move forward. And for example, Speaker, when we're talking about research and innovation, I wonder what is coming from the, uh, from the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs with some of the new science that we're learning about, uh, like PFAS, um, perfluoral alkyl and polyfluoral alkyl substances, or short-chain synthetic chemicals, or something I've been learning about as part of the Great Lakes Legislative Caucus work. And those are big words, but they're, you know, they're really small forever chemicals that get into our soil in a million different ways, that get into our bodies in a million different ways, and they never go away. And the research is growing, and then governments like ours are going to have to catch up and figure out what to do with that information. Because what we're seeing in the states, for example, Speaker, is that every farm that tests for PFAS, just about every farm that I'm aware of that has tested for PFAS and PFOA have found it. And what is happening in the states is 
some of those farms are being told then they are no longer allowed to produce food, they're no longer allowed to grow. So what farmer is going to test their soil if they know that if they get bad news, they can't, they can't use that soil anymore? So what is the government going to do with that information and how do we pull in the research, how do we pull that in to support farmers and make sure that all Ontarians have arable land, have, uh, have soil that indeed can be used for growing food. I mean, certainly in Ontario, we've been having conversations around how many acres of farmland are evaporating, okay, evaporating sounds like a passive process, are being destroyed and are, are no longer going to be able to be used for food production. So then also we need to be connecting with the research folks and listening to them, especially around PFAS and PFOA. And if people are like, what is she talking about? Look that one up. Um, it's, it's a growing body of, of problematic evidence for us um, across, uh, across North America. Um, speaker, one more thing that I wanted to highlight, because one of these research centers uh, is in Winchester. And so in Winchester, they have um, the Ontario Crops Research Centre in Winchester, and I raised this because I was raised in Winchester. I was I was born at the hospital in Winchester and lived in Chesterville and Winchester, and and am a, a product of that uh, rural community. We moved away actually from there to not that far from the Holland Marsh, but I remember Alt Foods uh, in that area, which was you know the first cheese factory in Dundas County in 1891, and I remember going there and getting big containers of margarine, which I feel like I must be misremembering that because, because it's a, it, margarine is not a dairy product, and Alt Foods certainly you know, were dairy giants, but I still remember going there. It, it was margarine, but they were in containers that they were either like white or fluorescent orange, and we weren't allowed to have the fluorescent orange stuff because... I had had an allergic reaction to strawberry shortcake cereal as a child, and my mother would not allow us to have any um, artificial colors. And when I talked to uh, the member from Temiskaming, and Cochrane, he remembers as well that in Quebec it was actually illegal to have margarine be the same color as butter. So they actually had to, to dye it and make it either sort of this white or this fluorescent orange for the kids sitting here. I know, crazy, right? <laughs> but. But anyway, so there are things like that that I remember, and I don't know that that was an innovation at the time, but we have watched, we have watched um, the agricultural sector and the, the food sector grow and change through the years. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to be able to stand here and kind of story tell today, because this is not a contentious bill, no. not even a little bit. Uh, but because it's here and we have the chance to talk about some of these things, uh, I'm glad to, and I will, I will wrap it up and leave it there, and if anyone has any amazing questions to ask me, we'll, we'll see what happens. Thank you. Questions? Questions? I recognize a member from Peterborough. Thanks, Madam Speaker. I was listening uh, to, to the speech, but I missed part of it, so if I could get you to, to explain a little bit more about the research that you did on uh, amphibians and tadpoles and, and, and so on when you were back in university because ironically that's the type of research that my daughter did as well when she was in the university. So I will tell you that in university I was an enthusiastic participant in some aspects of university life but I wasn't a big attender and so the field studies allowed me to not have to attend lectures. So I chose one that fit and it happened to be in Vietnam and so I went uh, on a field study to Vietnam, and it was a two-week course in the uh, Nam Katien rainforest. And all of my colleagues were studying insects, and I realized really quickly that I was not going to be successful in that. Um, and so I worked with a professor, his name was Ron Altig, uh, who had worked on the Anurin Key for North America, actually, but from Mississippi. And he was there studying tad, uh, tadpoles and frogs and basically doing a survey of uh, what was there after the defoliation uh, from Agent Orange in the war. And so I spent a lot of the time with the microscope Response. and little tadpoles in formalin 
drawing their mouth parts, of all things. But yes, I was collecting tadpoles in the rainforest for a summer. Who knew? <laughs> Question, the member from Waterloo. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The Agricultural Research Institute of Ontario is important, and we support it. That said, we have the next chapter of the Greenbelt scandal happening in Wilmot Township, Greenbelt 2.0, I call it. And, if it. and if this can happen to us, then it can happen to any farming community across Ontario. This government has enabling legislation before the House, the Get It Done Wrong Act, which fast-tracks expropriation of farmland, like the 770 acres of prime agricultural land in Wilmot. Developers caught wind of the rezoning from farmland to industrial and are offering to purchase the land cheap. So is the region, who are bound by an NDA at the request of the province. Mm -hmm. What do you make of the loss of 319 acres of farmland that this institute will never get the chance to study? Response, the member from Oshawa. Um, thank you. And obviously, the member has been... Um, has been spending a lot of time in this House bringing voice to this issue alongside the farmers. And I think it's an important reminder to all of us that we have to work with farmers. If they are sounding the alarm, then the government is on the wrong side of that conversation. We cannot afford to be losing uh, farmland that has, that has value for food production. Um, and certainly in this, this specific case, I know some of the concerning elements that the member has raised is that we don't know the details because of the NDA, because of the NDAs that have been signed. And we're seeing that that is a, a, a worrying trend um, in how this government does business in, in multiple areas. But at the end of the day, we should be doing our best to protect farmland, to work with farmers. Response. Um, and I think in this specific situation, to return to those farmers and have honest and open conversations about what comes next. Thank you. Further questions? I recognize the member from Essex. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I uh, want to offer to the member a quote from Dr. Siobhan Sharif, the Associate Vice President of Research at the University of Guelph. And he said the following, the modernized act will ensure Aereo can continue to grow Ontario by supporting world-class research and innovation that meets the needs of the modern agri-food industry, and the University of Guelph is there to be counted on as a long-term partner and advocate. We have had a long-standing relationship with AMAFRA, that's the uh, Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, and ARIO that has stood the test of time. Our commitment to Ontario's agri-food sector is rooted in history but focused on the future. I offer the member that quote, and I invite her to comment on it with the remaining time. Response, Oshawa. Thank you. Um, it is refreshing to stand here and talk about a bill that all of us support because the work has been done to get it to this point uh, with everyone rowing in the same direction, or rather everyone growing in the same direction. <laughs> when you have uh, academic institutions and the farming community, uh, as well as the research folks, all on side uh, with, these, with these changes, then that's, that's a good news story. And I hope that the government is heartened by the praise and that they will work harder to bring forward more pieces of legislation where everyone is on the same page because it's good, solid, well-researched legislation. Thank you. Further questions? Further questions? I recognize the member from Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I want to congratulate my friend from Oshawa for that speech. Um, she brings a lot of expertise into this house. She mentioned her training as an elementary educator. And, you know, I'm always shocked at the amount of research and sticky notes and preparation that goes into this member's speeches. But I want to ask you, just given what you said, I'm familiar with the fact that other parts of the world students are taught in school to know a lot more about the food that's growing in their communities. And if REO is actually going to start to do some research, could there not be a good case for doing more collaborative research with elementary and secondary school educators, even kindergarten and uh, preschool educators, so children begin to understand the kinds of foods and the kinds of products that are grown in their community, so they one day will teach that to their children? Response, a member from Oshawa. Um, thank you. And I, I love education. <laughs> I really do. Um, and any opportunity 
to help people better understand and interact with their world is the right thing. Um, whether kids learn about where their food is grown, uh, how it comes to them, if something ripens on a truck versus ripens on a tree, the nutrition uh, changes there, like all of that is, is of interest. We had talked earlier in the debate about food waste uh, and ways that we could do better. And I think when we're talking about education of not just our children, but of our neighbors, I think that it is incumbent upon any government to kind of, you know, go back to the public service announcement that maybe we remember from our childhood, maybe I'm dating myself, but to talk about ways to do better. Um, I remember when the compost bin was new. I remember when the recycling bin was new. We learned how to use it. We learned why to use it. And so if there are innovative things that are Response. coming from the research community, uh, I think broadly education is needed, um, and, but there's a real opportunity here to share some of it. Thank you. Further questions? Further questions? For the member from Waterloo. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, the member from Oshawa talked about how important it is to get legislation right and to do your due diligence and to bring people into the conversation to consult before, not after. Uh, this leaves us with better legislation, with better laws. Uh, there's a number of people right here in the House today who uh, have been participating for years now in advocating around intimate partner violence. And we do have the Renfrew County Report, which has 86 recommendations, 68 of those the province can be responsible for and should be responsible for. Just gonna remind can you the talk member, about the importance you know, about of process in creating legislation? Thank you, the member from Oshawa. Thank you. Um, and I, I'm going to tie these things together, and I very much appreciate having a full house of folks from Ontario here to participate in the process. So to your question about process, this, is a, this bill has been an example of, of, uh, of folks working together and that's important. But also, as you mentioned, uh, this afternoon will be a debate based on the Renfrew County inquest and the recommendations. And interesting in that is Renfrew County is a rural part of the world with very specific uh, how the world works in rural Ontario is different than how it works in downtown Toronto. Recommendations came from that inquest that were very particular uh, to a rural community. And so I think as we're going to leave this debate eventually, and not yet, don't worry, Speaker, um, I do think that involving communities, their expertise, whether that's research and science or farm, whether that's agency and, and organization workers, we have to draw from the expertise of those people who are offering it and are qualified to give it. We can't just make things up on our own. Thank you. A little stretch on the roundup, but okay. <laughs>